Hello folks and welcome back to the Folklore of Being and another video in the series Mischief, Mayhem and Cream Consumption. Now this is where we get into the cream part because we are looking at house goblins. So what about the goblins that make our house their home? They're, as you can predict, varied in their shapes, sizes and tempers, but they all share one thing in common. They're the most diligent and hard-working creatures in the scale of goblindom. They're modest and moral and expect graciousness and respect, but they can turn mean if slighted. Goblins can be, as you know from previous videos, troublesome and childlike, but mostly domestic goblins are ones that are usually kind and helpful. They will work hard for a household and protect it by keeping watch over it, or charming the household with skilled spells. In return, they expect a modest reward that is given subtly and discreetly, so as not to offend them. But they can turn mean by being spoiled or upset by the household. They prefer to work mostly at night or unseen, and any house goblin will complete all undone chores and farm work while everybody sleeps, and, if seen or snuck upon, can be frightened away. Lancashire, England is positively brimming with domestic bogarts, and many live in normal people's houses, but a few take up residence in rich people's homes, such as Townley Hall in Burnley, who is said to appear as a warning of death. Or the bogart of Barcroft Hall, who is known as the Grizzlehurst bogart, who seemingly had a physical form. He was a household bogart who turned mean and evil by being spoiled by the household. After an attempt by the family to move out failed, the bogart was killed and buried beneath an ash tree with a ritually buried cockerel and stake. However, this did not banish the bogart, for it returned in spirit form and resumed its malign and evil escapades. Another bogart who haunted Hoversall Hall near Ribchester was red down into the roots beneath a laurel tree and milk is often poured over the roots to keep the bogart laid. Laid is a form of exorcism where a spirit creature can be forced into an object such as a box, a cupboard or even a clock pendulum. Another much friendlier but still precocious bogart lived on a Yorkshire farm known as Castle Farm. This particular bogart was an inherited goblin. He had lived there for many, many generations of the farmer's family and was well loved as a bristly but hard-working member of the family. In return for farming duties, animal husbandry and household chores, the bogart was given nightly by the farmer's wife a bowl of cream. For the farmer's wife, who loved the bogart as much as the farmer did, wanted the bogart to have a nice reward for all his hard work. This was the life that the farmer, his wife and the bogart lived, until the farmer and his wife passed and the son took over. The new farmer Jim had married a city girl and she hated the farm. The animals were horrid, the smells were disgusting, and most of all, the bogart was not welcomed there. She refused the bogart his nightly bowl of cream and gave the goblin skim milk. The next day the milk was gone, but the bogart had done nothing in return for its payment. Though the bogart's presence in the farmhouse had become spiky and thunderous, it kept itself out of sight and simply made things feel uncomfortable for all. Trying to convince his wife to give the bogart his long-time dues bore no result, and in fact, the wife became more spiteful. That night, she put down spoiled milk for the bogart. Now, the country-born wife would have known not to tangle with the spirits, servant-like or not, but this city-born wife in her stubborn ignorance had declared war on a much more proficient and malignant enemy. From that day forwards, the battles had begun, and the bogart upset the household in as many ways as it could. It snatched food away from the hungry, or spent days upturning the house, and it bit and scratched at the wife. After enduring the bogart's torments for some time, the farmer and his wife quietly conspired to flit, that is, a Yorkshire term, to pack up and suddenly leave. But... How do you do this without alerting the bogart? Well, they made a great show of pretending their packing and boxing up of their home into the horse and cart was simply a spring clean. And though they could feel the bogart's disbelieving air, it gave them no bother. But when a neighbour came along and exclaimed, you're never flitting, and a scratchy voice came from the milk pile saying, that's right, Gregory, we're flitting, 
The farmer gave in and accepted that the Bogart was his and everything was put back into the house and the Bogart got his nightly bowl of cream again and everything returned to normal at Castle Farm. A hob is a helpful spirit who looks after children and could cure whooping cough. A method up north to conjure the hob for healing was to chant Hob, ho, hob, hob, ho, hob, my bairn's got tink cough, take it off, take it off. Like many of the other house goblins I will describe, the hob are hard-working creatures who would take care of the household, farm or children, and all they ask for in return is a little bread and a little cream to be left out for them as a reward for their work. If you leave something like clothing, they will take offence and leave. However, some hobs can be evil. A nasty hob haunted the road between Herworth and Neesham near Darlington. He was eventually exercised and put underneath a large stone for 100 years, and anyone who sat on that stone was said to become trapped beneath it. Another goblin named Hob haunted the rivers of Yorkshire. He is thought to be the spirit of a horseman who had drowned. He confuses travellers by darkening roads, removing signposts, and placing obstacles in their paths. A hobgoblin is another house spirit and in appearance is that of a kindly old man with a long beard. The word derives from the Welsh hob to hop and cobelin or gobelin, so hopgoblin. Because of this name, it's thought that the hopgoblin hopped on one leg. He is a kindly sort who will help around the house with small chores, but he can be just as much of a prankster as a bogart or bogey, or even dangerous if offended. Skilled in the magical arts, a hobgoblin can put charms of good luck on a house, and he keeps away evil spirits. His favourite place is to be in front of the fire, feeling all warm and cosy, with his pipe and his cream. Hobgoblins will take payment for the services in the form of food if it's left unassumingly out, but if you give him some new clothing, he will take great offence and will leave you, taking with him his estimable services and any kinds of protections and charms he may have had upon the household. This is perhaps because many items of the goblin's clothing can be magical. A cape or a cap, for example, can be charmed, and you may be insulting him by revealing you know little about him when the hobgoblin knows so much about you. On the other hand, a pixie will go about wearing ragged clothes and would gratefully accept a kind gift of new clothing. A hobgoblin, though, like many of the other goblins described here, can also be free roaming hobgoblins, and they are known by the Cornish as bookers. Hailing from the southwest of England, they are spirits of the land and sea and must be treated with respect. Fishermen leave a booker a catch of the day, and a farmer will leave bread and beers. These hobgoblins also live deep in the forests, in bubble castles in brooks, and in secret places only seen by moonlight. They enjoy sitting in the shade of toadstools, riding eggshell boats, and they ride on ferns, rushes, bees and dragonflies. They're creatures with a love of peace and solitude. Sometimes, if a wild hobgoblin on its travels encountered a human that they took a liking to, they would gift that person with an object that, if lost, would cause the hobgoblin to hate that person. Mistreatment of a hobgoblin's domain can also bring down the wrath of the goblin, so perhaps it's better to encounter a domestic hobgoblin than it is a wild one. Native to Shetland and the Western Isles, to Cornwall, the Highlands and the borderlands of Scotland, a bruni are described as being child-sized and shaggy-haired with wrinkled faces. They like to live in selected corners, in the roof rafters, an attic or a cellar the last of which can cause indulgences by the bruni. They're also described as friendly little old men who wear ragged clothing in earthly colours and red caps upon their heads. They are sun-cooked as if working a great deal outdoors and are said to be extremely strong despite their diminutive sizes. A bruni living in a home or on a farm is one who is hard-working, proud and set in the ways of proper behaviours. Things are to be neat and in their place, and the servants and maids to be reliable and hard-working. They prefer not to be seen in their work and will fulfil their duties at night or at the earliest hours of the morning. If they become aware that they have been seen, they will flee and never return. 
A farmer in Sussex snuck up to the barn one night and peered in at the Brunies working away with their fairy tools. He overheard them saying to each other, See how I sweat! See how I sweat! And in gratitude, the farmer cried out, Well done, my little men! Whereupon, in fright and offence, the brownies took off, never to work for the farmer again. The brownie will manage a home like a head servant, keeping the maids and other staff in line and taking up the duties fitting for a goblin of his station. If the mannequin feels like his hard work has been taken advantage of by the staff, or that they have become idle, he will pull them from their beds or pinch them at the mildest, at the worst of his outrages being put upon the household, where he'll smash and destroy all that gives his whim into. If, however, the household staff are courteous, honest and hard-working, this will never occur. He will even drop a penny into the shoes of those who he sees as being meritorious. This is amusing somewhat since he himself takes offence to being paid or tipped and is indulged by the householder with a subtle exchange of services. This is because... The brownies won't take wages directly, but if a coin is dropped or left in a place the brownie often goes, he will pocket it and will whistle as he does so to make nothing of it. He will also take food left in a place politely meant for him. Now he has a fondness for cakes made with oats and honey, but has an extra special love for cream. Devonshire brownies also like a bowl of hot water for a bath, and to be honest, he deserves it after all that hard work. A brunie can be become dazzled by luxury if you leave out too many goodies, and he can become as lax as the maids he pinches. It's a good idea not to offer a brunie fine new clothing, because this can cause the goblin to become vain and abandon a life of service for one of dandiness, leaving the poor household staff to pick up the brownie slack. Or it may simply offend the brownie and cause him to leave shouting, What have we here, hempen hampen, here I will never tread nor stampen. Now, not all goblins are created equal when it comes to having grey matter in one's skull. And there is a contingent of the brownie sort who are a rather chaotic bunch. Dobies are these brownies, and they're to be found in England and Scotland. These brownies are good and simple-natured. They're well-meaning but too gentle and inept at whatever they try their hands at. So, if entrusted to guard treasure, they will be easily talked or tricked into giving it over. If trying to help with the house or farm, they will spill milk, ruin crops, or break equipment. A silky is a female version of a bruni. They dress in silk dresses and are very dainty. They keep servants in line and do household chores. They are thought to be the spirits of women who live nearby and are messengers for finding treasure or documents. Once their work is done or the message given, the silky will depart. They sometimes like to sit in trees and rustle their silk dresses in the winds. The Bubach is a Welsh version of the Brownie and it shares the same qualities of being as the Brownies in a love of service and good order, but they seem to have a dislike for priests. One Bubach terrorised a minister as he tried to pray, pulling away his stool and disrupting the household, before finally materialising in the form of the minister himself, who, seeing this apparition, took it for the deaf omen it's believed to be and fled in terror. Another goblin from Wales is the Buka, who, like the Brunies above, likes to be household spirits, but these ones are often transient and will move from household to household. Described as dark-skinned with long noses and dressed in shabby farmer clothes, these goblins have no love for non-drinkers and will often haunt pubs and inns. Like most household goblins, he works diligently at household chores and like to be rewarded with bread, cream, cake and milk. One story of a Buka recounts when one day his favourite member of the household, a young maid, in a moment of impishness, instead put down some urine meant for dyeing cloth. When the Buka came to get his reward and instead found a bowl of fermented wee-wee, he became upset. After much remonstration and insults towards her, he moved in with a servant girl from another farm who gave him his bread and milk as he pleased and, in return, he resumed his duties of household work. 
Now, this is where the story moves into Rumpelstiltskin territory, as the maid, though happy with her goblin helper, was curious about his name and kept asking. But the goblin was not about to give away his name to someone who could use it in magic, so he refused. But one day, the goblin, thinking the servant girl gone, went about his work singing, how she would laugh if only she knew Gawaring a throt is my name. But the girl was hiding at the bottom of the stairs, and upon hearing this, she shouted, Now I know your name! And with that, the goblin disappeared from the home. Now his next attempt at domestic bliss was with a farmhand called Moses, who was called away to fight with Henry Tudor at the Battle of Bosworth, where he sadly died. This loss caused the goblin to turn evil and mean, and he became an angry spirit in the household, who disrupted the lives of those who lived there, until a cunning man was called in to banish him. In Germany, there are goblins known as Witcherlein from the Saxon unseely or uncanny creature. As house spirits, they live behind walls and under floors. They are said to be friendly and hard-working, but grotesquely ugly. They invariably fall in love with pretty maidens and suffer horrible tantrums when, appearing before their loves, they are soundly rejected. Witchy lines will act as a presage of ill luck and misfortune, knocking three times to indicate a bad omen to the household. Wilder living witcher lions live in your garden and they will frighten away unwanted visitors. But they are afraid of running water and avoid creeks or streams and will hide when it rains. This is because it is said that they were getting doused by the religious with holy water and this would make them disappear for good. One of them can also be driven away by erecting a ship's mast on your property. On the Isle of Man, there are brunies known as the Fenderi. These brunies are tall, hairy, and grotesque creatures known for having a prodigious strength. They are favoured by farmers because of their strength and size, as they are able to fresh a whole barn full of corn in one night. However, the Fenderi are a little like dobies in that they are not very strong of mind, despite their strength and size. And so often, the Fenderi will accidentally drive cattle off cliffs, or go about other farming business with all muscle and no thinking, causing a hurricane's worth of chaos. They will, though, make compensations for any losses caused by replacing the lost or damaged goods. And, unlike many of the so-called house spirits who work at night, the Fenderi will work until daybreak to make sure he is seen hard at work. He, too, has his own mischievous side, and if he offered you his hand to shake, you should replace it with something else or politely decline, because he's trying to crush your hand with his beefcake ones. And like many of the Brunies, offers of rewards will insult, and clothing offered in one case caused the Fenderi to put a curse on the family for every item of clothing offered. Lob, lie by the fire are Bruni-like creatures who have long tails. In some descriptions, they're about thumb size with an antiquated face and patchwork clothing. Not particularly bright and a little clumsy, they are never less quite strong. They're suited to farm work and mostly work at threshing and mowing of corn. They work at an inhuman pace and can get the work of ten men finished in a night. They, like Brunies, prefer to work at night time and will spend the day snoozing by the half-fire. In return for their work, they too get paid in milk or cream. In Elizabethan times, they were known as lubberkins, and in one of Milton's poems, he describes them as a lubber fiend. Tells how the drudge in goblin sweat to earn his cream bowl duly set, when in one night a glimpse of morn, his shadowy flail has threshed the corn. That ten day labourers could not end, then lies him down the love offend, and stretched out all the chimney's length, basks at the fire his hairy strength, and cropful out of doors he flings, ere the first cock his mating rings. Another aspect of the lob is that of an abbey goblin. These are seen as demonic creatures who haunt the abbey wine cellars and tempt the monks to ill behaviour. 
In Ireland and the Highlands of Scotland, there are the Gurach, who are described as being small, hairy and stocky creatures with great strength and a diligent work ethic. The Ulster Guraks are described as being four foot tall and appearing boneless as they roll down the hills like sausages. The Highland Goblins are either richly dressed or described as being naked and hairy, like most Scots. Sorry, Dad. One such naked and hairy Gurak had pity taken on him and clothing was offered to him, at which point the Gurak, upset, left the farm. And so here ends our tales of household goblins, and I hope that you have yourself a household goblin that can help you with the household chores, but uh, if you don't put food out, perhaps they're raiding your fridge at night anyway, and you're blaming the kids or the husband or the boyfriend. So maybe you're lucky enough to have a house goblin. I think I don't because nothing ever gets done here, including by me, because I'm lazy. So I actually could do with a goblin. But that's enough rambling for now. This is the end of the Household Spirits version of The Art of Being a Goblin. And I will say thank you for listening, for watching, and I hope to see you in the next video. And if you enjoyed this one, drop a little like for me to help the channel out. And I will say goodbye for now and see you in the next video.